Let's pray as we begin. Father God, I pray that as we do our business tonight together, that you would be our guide, that you would help us to understand more than we knew coming in, and that we would be more confident as your children handling your word. Thank you so much for giving us each other and not having us do this life alone, but that you put us in community. And this community that we have on Wednesday nights, thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us here. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. 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 So I want you to remember three important dates. Can you guess what those might be? No. My anniversary. No. <laughs> well, that's the 22nd of November, isn't it? 760, 722, yep. and All of these are BC dates. 760, 722, and 586. Our book gave us the number 587. I think he's wrong. <gasps> I think it's actually 586 BC. Why are those important when we're talking about the, the prophets and we're talking about the prophetic books? In the Old Testament, 760 is the date when you have Israel going from one kingdom to two. It's it's when the kingdom divided. 760 BC, you've got the northern kingdom where there were 10 tribes, and then the southern kingdom where there were two tribes. The southern kingdom begins to be called Judah, right? Or, or, Or Benjamin sometimes. The north is called Israel, and sometimes it's called Ephraim, okay? And, and 760 is significant because you have this massive split within, within Israel. The, the, the clans, the families, the tribes, they split. And Jerusalem is the capital in the south. And that, the, the, the tribes, uh, you know, Judah and Benjamin are basically in the south. And then the Levites kind of stay. They're not an official named tribe. There's really 13 tribes in Israel because the Levites, they don't have any land, but they're the ones that are a family clan that takes care of the temple, right? So that's a big date. It's a big movement in history. It's where the time, the clock starts ticking and you get all these prophets come in because of the 760 thing. There's, because of the split, there's all of these warnings going on and you have the prophets starting to talk. God's moving his, his, his prophets to speak to the to the north and south so that's a big one 722 bc that's when assyria comes down and wipes out the 10 northern tribes 722 bc is where the the northern tribes gone right and they were they were majorly spread away apart like they're called the 10 lost tribes for a reason they're so lost, in fact, that, that you can have Mormons claim that the tribes came across the water and settled in America. If you've ever studied about Mormonism, that's kind of part of their story there, and that some of the ten lost tribes came and settled in America, and there, there's heritage there of Mormonism as well. I, it's weird stuff. That's free. Don't, I'm not charging for that. Um, and so then 722 is where the northern tribes are all carried off by Assyria. And then the 586 is when the southern kingdom is carried off by Babylon. That's where you hear about Daniel and all those kinds of things. And you have King Nebuchadnezzar and all of the stories around, you know, um, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all that. They're, they're taken out of the southern kingdom and they're moved into the uh, nation of Babylon Uh, away from their promised land. So the reason why God is doing all of this work through his prophets during this time is basically because of these dates. When you read in there why the, we we read within our text that there is a hot spot of time in Israel's history where all these prophetic works are being written, it's because of those major dates. And I think that's actually... In my mind, it's almost more important to keep in your mind. 760, remember BC, your your numbers are getting smaller, right? So 760 is way back, and 722 is a little closer to us, and then 586 is even closer to us. And so that last uh, movement out of the Promised Land in 586 BC, it's God warning and warning and warning and warning and warning and warning, and then 
inevitably God is a God of his word and he does what he says. And that's why these, he, he moves, he moves nations like chess pieces on a board. God does that. And that hard for me to understand, hard for me to understand, hard for me to understand how God can say that Babylon is exhibiting the will of God. Think about that. And the book of Habakkuk, as we're going to move into Habakkuk on Sunday, particularly, just an incredible thing to wrestle with, the problem of evil in this world. And how is it that we reconcile, that we look around our lives, and there's all of this evil going on, what do we do with that? How do we reconcile that? Habakkuk is going to help us figure that out, actually. And the prophets, I think, help us figure that out. Because I'm jumping way down here to the hermeneutical suggestions. One of the things that's important is to remember, and Ali and I were just looking at it, and I was going to make mention of it, and he helped me remember it because he asked the question. And when you move into the hermeneutical discussion, things that were sins in the Old Testament against the Old Covenant are still sins in the New Covenant. And I think I said to him, Ali, something like, Ecclesiastes is true. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, it's not, the, the sins are all the same. Why we get in trouble and why things are going south, those reasons are still the same. And the, I, I wanna, I'm advocating for the prophets and for you to spend time in the prophets, specifically Habakkuk, because that's where we're going next as a church, and I think it's so timely that we are. And I wanted to read Romans and make mention of how often Habakkuk 2.4 shows up, because the New Testament thinks that the prophets are important as well. So don't listen to me, listen to the scriptures. And so as we talk about the prophets tonight, was it, did it make sense to you, in, by and large, as we went through and, and how to understand prophecy? And some of the uh, things that we discussed with respect to uh, the parables and the epistles, some of those, some of those uh, truths, some of those muscles that we flexed a little bit, we're using when we, when we think about the prophets as well in chapter 10. And there's cross-pollination of skills that we're learning. These things sort of are like your math textbook in high school. Don't relent on reading and staying current in your math textbook because one chapter builds on another. You know, algebra is basically just shorthand addition and subtraction when it comes right down to it. If you don't know how to do addition and subtraction, you're not going to know how to do algebra. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things. If we, if we start flexing these muscles and, and, and taking the time to learn these skills about how to read the scripture, we're, 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 we're becoming stronger in all areas of reading scripture. And we're, we're, we'll be less, you and I will be less likely to be taken in by false teaching. And I, I mean, I think I said this way back when, we, now that a bunch of our, our um, lectures are on the church YouTube page, we can go back and check, but I think I said it would be great if one of the students that was in the Wednesday night who attended Wednesday night would come up to Dave and go, wait a minute, Pastor Dave, what are we doing here? I think, I think we, ha we should talk about this. And then he would go, wow, that's awesome. I have people who are on their toes. Uh, so as we, as we think about this, um, one, of the, one of the problems with prophecy is that we use that term or think of it with English brains and we think, Prophecy is like telling the future, right? Yeah, it's not, is it? Did, did you pay attention? It's very little, like less than 5% of prophetic literature is actually talking about a, a future event in a way that's, well, not already been fulfilled, right? And even, even the parts that are talking about a future that had, had yet to be fulfilled when they were writing, was a small portion of it. And the word prophecy literally means, basically, here it is, truth announcing. Prophecy means truth announcing. 
So when we have a sermon on Sunday mornings, do you know technically that's prophecy? Did you know that? Yeah. Because we have a church that preaches the word, we have prophecy on Sunday mornings. Does that make you feel good? It makes me feel good. Because we're proclaiming the truth of the word, that is what we're hearing, is the prophecy. The truth is being proclaimed. And the prophets, that's all they're doing, right? Um, they're talking about things that are the little future. They're like little future, that's my terms. It's short-term future things. To us, we're looking back at it, and say, we see it as already happened. But to the original audience, right, the, the prophet is speaking to them about something that God is saying about to happen. And it's right around the corner. And so to us, pretty much everything is past. Some very small amounts of things within prophetic literature has yet to be fulfilled, arguably. Some, some, scholars, some scholars have a lot that they say is there. Some, some are in the middle, and some say it's all been uh, fulfilled. And everything has been pretty much fulfilled in the short run, and then might have a larger, remember that, that picture of the little disc and the larger disc? And there's a larger fulfillment uh, that's coming, um, which is, what, what do they call that? Uh, he's got a, la a Latin term for it. It's near the end. I'll find it in my notes and I'll, I'll tell you. But it's, it means that like a New Testament writer sort of gives you a fuller meaning of something that was said back in the day. There you go. Whatever that is. I didn't take French. I had to learn it, but I didn't. I didn't uh, it means fuller meaning. It means fuller meaning. Thank you. So um, prophecy, the prophets, they're... Basically, if you notice this little, the authors, they're just basically God's spoke, spokesperson. He, they're only saying what God's telling them to say. Interesting, because that's how Jesus characterizes himself. I'm just saying what my father is saying. I'm just saying what my father tells me to say. And there are some allusions to Jesus being the greatest prophet that are actually correct. There's some biblical allusions that point back to Moses, and they say that they'll, do you remember some of this, where that Moses, Jesus was closer to God than Moses even, and Moses was considered the, the prophet that was the closest to, to God. I mean, he was up on the mountain and was in the presence of God to the point where when he walked down, he was a glow-in-the-dark prophet, <laughs> right? He came down off that mountain, and he had the Shekinah glory. That's how close Moses was, and we read that Jesus was even closer than, than that. Um, and uh, I would cite the transfiguration, and that Jesus produced his own glory. He didn't reflect any glory. He produced his own. So he's greater prophet than Moses, but I digress. So the authors are only spokespersons. They're basically saying, God gave me this, and now I'm telling it to you. And... There's a discussion right away that we revisit again um, in the exegetical task, but there's this problem of history. You notice how this keeps coming up? This is not the first time in the first chapter that the problem of being separated so far from the original audience is a problem, right? That we need to be careful about how we read Scripture because, you know, if, if it's, let's say, Amos... Amos is writing it right around 760 B.C. Okay, math whizzes, 2024 back to 760 B.C. I mean, isn't that like 2,800 years of time? Something like that? Give or take? So we have almost 3,000 years separating us from when Amos is writing. That's, that's a, a very high bar to achieve if we're trying to do it on our own. And this is one of those chapters that our authors say, guess what, we're gonna need help. We wanna be going after help. We wanna, we wanna find help in places like Bible dictionaries. We wanna find commentaries. And then we wanna find 
helpful handbooks um, that, that are like this book is one of those that the author is referring to. And then he, in, the, in the chapter also, he, he refers to how to number two. Did you guys follow what that meant? It's, it's, if you look in the front of our book, it'll give you abbreviations. And the how to number two means how to read the Bible book by book, which is one of those that's in our list of resources. It's written by the same authors as our text that we're using, but it's like it gives you a breakdown of every book of the Bible and how to read it. And so that's one of those that I always recommend. After you've read How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, pick up a copy of How to Read the Bible book by book. Because you can look at the book of, let's say, Hosea, and it'll, it'll give you some some real good hints as to what's going on during the time when Hosea is writing. Why did he write it? Who is his audience? What was going on during the nations, in the nation of Israel during the time he's writing? Good stuff. Commentaries, the back of this book will hit the last week, our, our four, week 14, and we're going to go through the appendix. But in the back of your book, in the glossary section, is all suggestions for every book of the Bible on what a good commentary is. Really, really helpful. I was encouraged because I was looking through those and almost every book of the Bible, I have at least one of the commentaries they suggest. I'm like, yes! All right, I made a good choice. I didn't refer to this uh, annotated bibliography that they have in the back. I had a different one. And there was a meeting of the minds. And so there's great resources in the back. If you're ever studying a book and you want to know what a good resource is for a t particular book, look in the back of How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It will guide you to, to solid resources. And so we're going to need some help because of the problem of history. We want to read this and do justice to the text. We don't want to do violence to the text. Okay? And then we have the function, which is what is the function of prophecy and the bottom line and the short of it is is that it's all about covenant enforcement that's why the, the when you say the prophets don't say anything on their own and they're only saying what god tells them to do it's because of the covenant has been broken or it's been followed and god wants the people to know that they're either doing great or they better straighten up I mean, if you had a dad who would tell you exactly how you're doing, you know, our father wants us to know how we're doing. He gives us an instruction booklet on how to be one of his children. And I'm holding a Bible in my hand for a reason. It's right here. This is the instruction booklet. And it's no wonder that churches are walking away from this instruction booklet, is it not? The enemy wants to win. Get your churches away from the Bible. Right? So the function is best understood when we read it and think, okay, Joel is writing because God told him to. And he's sharing things that God's telling him to share. And there are some um, common things you'll find in all of prophecy and he, our author lists six blessings. Do you remember that? It's like agricultural, you know, bounty, and you're going to have lots of children, and everybody's going to be healthy, and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And then there are the, the ten curses, which are all D, okay? It's like dearth was in there. Come on, dearth? They're working pretty hard to keep the alliteration going, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, I think Kay Douglas and myself were the only ones that really knew what dearth meant, right? So, but there's those curses in there, and all, any curse that you see falls under kind of one of those ten categories. And uh, it's, it's interesting to me that the function of prophecy is to remind their audience of what Scripture already says. Now, I'm going to ask a hard question, and I don't want to know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How many of you went back and read Leviticus like the book suggested? Leviticus, what was the chapter, 20? 
six, something like that. I, I read it, but I did read it again. I don't remember the address. I can get you to the church, but I can't get you to the pew. But it like tells you all the blessings if you follow the covenant and then you get all these curses, right? And they're, I mean, they're shocking. They're very stark. It just tells you the way it is. You know, there's going to be lots of bad things that will happen if you don't follow me. And there's really great things that happen if you do it my way. Would you suggest to someone that that's still the case today in 2024? If you follow God's ways, life is easier. If you choose to not follow his ways, life gets really hard. Right? It's true. It's the, the, one of the commandments says, do not lie or bear false witness, right? Don't lie. That's the one that I always did in student ministries. Guess what, what happens if, if you lie? You got to remember what lie you told and who you told it to. And if you told a different lie to someone else, wait a minute, I don't want to mix that up because I told her one lie and I told him another lie. And if I flip-flop those, now I'm in trouble. And eventually, you're okay in the short term, but the long run, you're in trouble. But if you tell the truth every time, it's so easy. I don't have to remember what I said. I just tell the truth. You know, all of us were little kids and... Did you eat the last cookie? No, chocolate chip marks around your face, you know, whatever. <laughs> but living it God's way. And the, the prophets are, are there to tell, remind, uh, in, in their own words, they're going to they're gonna say to a group of people of Israel, and sometimes it's other nations, they're prophesying against other nations as well, but they're telling them the truth about God's law. And if you read the Leviticus or Deuteronomy, which is basically second, like, duplicated law, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomos or whatever, means second law, means it's just Moses rehearsing all of those things and going over it again. So if you follow those things, you know that there's nothing new under the sun in the prophets. They just say it in different terms, right? Uh, and they're either using language that's more appropriate to their town or their region or the southern kingdom over the northern kingdom, who, you know, that sort of thing, the 760 split. So that, that's the important thing to remember, that the, the prophets are basically God's spokespersons that are reminding people about the covenant and how God's going to enforce the covenant, either for good or for ill. Got it? Man, it's, so, it's such good stuff when you read it like that. Um, and then we hit the hard stuff, which is the exe exegetical task. Again, we get that we need outside help. Uh, we're going to definitely need Bible dictionaries, you know, and, and good commentaries and uh, good, uh, solid people in our lives that have maybe studied it a little bit more than you have. And aren't afraid to say, I don't know. That's one of the things. Look for someone who's ready to say, I don't know, but I can find out. That's the kind of help we want to we wanna have. And one of the major problems is the distance in historical context. It's such an important thing that the author hits it more than once. Because he starts with the problem of history, and then he comes back to it and, and, and deals with it again. And this is where we can read in the how to read the Bible book by book and get more specifics about what was going on in the time when, you know, Isaiah was writing or Jeremiah was writing and Malachi or, you know, I said it last time, I think Malachi, that the Italian prophet, he's the last one in the, in the Old Testament before we get to Matthew. And um, the importance that that happens at the very end of Malachi, the, the statement that's put in there, that's still true today. We, we read about that in our text, really good stuff. Did anyone read what that said? Someone should look that up and read it for us because it's important. Um, I think when we, when we were reading the Gospels and I talked about read paragraph by paragraph, when we're reading the epistles, you want to read paragraph by paragraph, don't pull something out of context. 
Boy, is that important in prophecy. When you're reading one of the prophets, it's important to remember the paragraph, which is also known as an oracle. And that's not just a, a, an IT term or an IT company, right? That is, that is a grouping paragraph of prophecy is an oracle. And I want to make sure we understood that's what oracle means. It's basically a paragraph, a, a full thought of prophecy. You know, he, your author that you're reading, he starts in here and he finishes here. And that's why we need help because it's kind of hard to, to discern where an oracle starts and where it stops. And, you know, we got some examples in the book, did we not, of uh, prophecy and oracles and how many oracles were in the book of Hosea, wasn't it? I forget the exact example that they gave us, actually. I'm sorry. I think it was Hosea 4, something like that. I'm not sure. So, the oracles is a way we need to think, and he gives us five examples of oracles. I was a little discouraged. Was anybody else discouraged when it's like, there are five oracles we're going to give you, but that's no way exhaustive? Like the types of oracles, he gives us five. Do you remember those? The lawsuit, the woes, you know, all those different kinds of, of uh, oracles. And that's not all of them. It's a little intimidating. So that's why we want to have good outside help, because we don't have to remember all of them. And there are men and women who are smarter than us, who can help, it, help us know all the different kinds of oracles that we may be reading about. And it makes sense, too, where the author says, have you ever tried to read the, I'm going to say, the book of Isaiah? Have you ever tried to sit down and just read it? It, like, wears you out. Just kind of get frustrated, just kind of going, really? I can't handle it anymore. I've got to walk away. And it's because that's probably over the course of, of a long time, and these oracles have all been written down and collected, and, they, and, then, and then now they're the book of Isaiah, right? And so don't try to read them all like that all at once. It's not the way it was designed to be read, read anyway, I don't think. It was a little here and a little there. What, what's this oracle saying? What's that oracle saying? What kind of oracle is it, I wonder? And what was going on in Israel at the time that Isaiah is writing about such things in Isaiah 9, right? That's a pretty big chapter. Or Isaiah, what are some of the other big chapters in Isaiah? Isaiah. Yes. What, why is he writing like that? And is it legitimate to consider some of those messianic? Or are they? You know? Was there a fulfillment in the short run in Isaiah's time, those, those passages? There's good evidence that a lot, the majority of those passages were fulfilled in Isaiah's, short, shortly thereafter in Isaiah's time. Now, they had a larger meaning, you know, but uh, we could get into the weeds there really quickly. That gets me excited, but would bore you to death. So... Uh, help is really important when you're reading the prophets, especially when you get into this. This is actually in green. It's poetry. And there's a lot of poetry, a lot of poetry, not just in the prophets, but in all of Scripture. And I thought that, that they, the author was making my point that I made a while back. Remember we were singing about my baloney has a first name? That's actually poetry. It's lyrics. Lyrics comes from the word, from the discipline of poetry that we call music. And the reason they did it was because Israel was an oral culture. They were not a written culture. We are experiencing in our own lifetime, we're moving from a written culture to an oral culture. You don't believe me? Watch a student and what they spend their time doing they're in their phone watching TikTok reels uh-huh see we don't read anymore we listen we watch oral culture helps us remember so um, the fact that there is poetry and it's so much of it makes total sense when you understand that when you're trying put yourself in 
uh, in the room with your kids and you're trying to help them remember things about God. Poetry helps them remember just like my baloney has a first name. It's O-S-E-A-R. Or any of those jingles that we knew growing up. They're still in our psyche because they help us remember. And it's high poetry, some of it. I told you that Genesis 1 and 2 is really poetry. It's a way for Moses to help people remember that God made everything. And it was, it was a way to, to get it stuck in your brain. And so there's all kinds of poetry. Did you read any of the prophets and look for the different kinds of parallelism? Did you, did you see any of that? The synonymous parallelism where the line one says one thing and then line two says that same thing in another way so that they're sort of telling you the same thing, but synonymously, synonyms, I worked really hard to be able to say that because it's a hard word for me to say. It comes out like a spice rather than a grammar. Syn yeah, I just did it myself. Okay, there's the, the same, same parallelism. I'll say it again because I'll mess it up. And then there's antithetical parallelism where it sort of turns things and, and, and turns it on its head. It gives you sort of the opposite. It turns um, a contrasting idea. It introduces a contrasting idea. And then the synthetic parallelism, which is my favorite because it takes the idea and then stays with that idea but gives you more information about it. It's good stuff. And it may seem like, oh, why is it that this author keeps saying these things over and over in sort of a similar way? It's because the author was led by God to tell you not to forget, right? He doesn't want you to forget. That's why with Psalm 119, we'll talk about that next week, is written the way it is. It's a totally cool psalm. Uh, so this idea of poetry, uh, I put this book up, how to Read the Psalms by Tremper Longman. This is one that's suggested in our chapter this week. I happen to have my copy that I found. It was one of the boxes that I opened in the garage, and I pulled out some of the more imp uh, important books to the time right now, and I, this is one that I found, and I'm like, I know we're going to look at this one because our author talks about it. it. It is extremely helpful when talking about and understanding poetry. And it's how to read the Psalms. Guess what the Psalms mostly, like, a highest percentage is? It's poetry. That's why we're in the prophets talking about poetry, and our author is suggesting this book. I'm going to suggest it again. I'll have it again with me next week when we talk about the Psalms. And it, it's, you know why I love stuff like this? Because it is a, it's a key that unlocks God's word in a way that is, Amazing. It's like you see God's fingerprints in the lives of people he has writing the Psalms when you start reading it, you know, it, with some of these things that you're taught, when you have those in mind. It just blows, well, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. It's amazing. I want you to have that same experience. That's why I'm, I'm putting some of these up there and why I put uh, Bible project videos up. I, I think I put two up this week. I, I held off. I didn't give you any of them until just before, you know, we got here tonight because I wanted you to have all the time off that you could possibly have. But they're really great. The one on poetry, and then there's the second one that I put up that's, um, that's uh, our prophecy, and then there's the other one that's uh, also related to that one that kind of follows the, the first one I put up on the Bible Project. I highly recommend reading them. There's another one on Psalms that I'm going to put up next week. You can, you, can, you can work ahead if you want. Bible Project, Psalms. Highly recommend. Good stuff. Okay, so finishing with uh, hermeneutics, and then we'll be dismissed. The author gives, gives us suggestions of caution, concern, and then benefit. I think that the caution side of things, um, the caution really was excellent, I thought. Because I've personally experienced as a pastor someone who has not taken the warning of caution and, and rushing into prophecy as future telling, 
and it wasn't about that time in that audience. It was really about us, and they rip it out of context. They ignore all of the things that we've learned. In fact, doesn't it list like four or five things that are ignored? Um, all uh, breaking the rules that we've learned, where they, they ignore the context, the intent, the style, and the wording. It's on page 207. Such an interpretation embarrassingly ignores the context, the intent, the style, and the wording. We must be careful that we do not make prophetic oracles or any part of Scripture say what we would like it to say. Rather, we must try to hear what God intends it to say. You should underline that section. It's the second to last full paragraph on 207, if you see it there. Man, that's good. Care is being a careful Christian. All right, so it is 7.10. I will let you go now. Let's reconvene at 7.40 or shortly thereafter. I will come and give you a warning, two-minute warning. This, this group, I'll try to make it a different number of minutes just because I'll, I'll try to keep, keep you guessing. But okay, you guys got, everybody have questions? You can find the spot where you want to go. I'm not going to give you any direction on how to break into your groups. Ready and break. Go. Okay, for those of us who are in here, we can cheat and start as people come back in. Questions that you had or thoughts or comments? I see that hand. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think it was, was it Isaiah? Yeah, there was, there's, uh, there's really that different, yeah, the different uh, physical manifestations to try and make a starker, bigger point. Yeah, that's, that really happened. And it wasn't that he was naked, but he was in his skivvies. Embarrassing. You know, I, I think, yeah, there's... It's, uh, it's a way for the Lord to really make a stark point, to, to really drive it home more, yeah, yeah. And I guess that, one of the things that came to my mind on that is, too, that it's, it's another way that it, it just points out that we're 2,800 years separated from that sort of sensibility. Yeah. As here we sit, that's weird. Why, why would you do that? Right. right. And I think... The best answer to that is that it's because it was that far back and that long ago. You know, my kids would look at various fashion choices that we had back when I was a kid, and uh, they would ask questions as to why would you ever wear something that looked like that, Dad? Why did people wear blue ruffled uh, tux shirts at their wedding? That's weird. Why would there be ruffles that stuck way out past? And I think that's just... Uh, does that kind of give you a little bit of a handle on why it's weird and it's just, it's definitely what happened, but it was a different time. Parachute pants. <laughs> yeah. Zumba. Rolled up jeans. Yep. Yeah, that was in the 90s, I think, wasn't it? So. It was another way to bring home the, a point, yes. Whatever. I mean, there are several examples of that sort of thing, that, that a strange physical representation of a spiritual problem. And, and that's what you're trying to say, right? Yeah, there's a spiritual thing going on here, and this points it out even more. Uh, yeah. They didn't have neon signs back then, so a half-naked prophet was the way that the Lord could use to get people's attention. Yes. The nature of prophecy moving from the old to the new. Well, I wondered about that because it could be that, that, that idea of how a New Testament author sort of 
expands on the prophecy and makes a fuller meaning. That could be one, one answer to that question, I thought. But I, I don't have a good enough answer that I would feel good about answering that. You hit me in a soft spot well, on that. Well, it, it, was, it was prophecy and then it was proclaiming truth. Um, it, that's where we kind of get hooked on that. It's not necessarily talking about, it was narrative as well. And there was a, a prophetic nature of it that Paul is picking up on. So yes and no. You know, it was, Paul is, is um, he can get away with doing something like that because there's illumination along with inspiration. inspiration. <laughs> yep. But there's illumination that Paul had because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Our illumination is lacking that inspiration from that aspect. So we want to be careful about that. Yes. So, yeah, I don't... Because Jesus is being pointed to all throughout Scripture... There is a certain aspect of fulfillment, I think, with respect to Jesus. And that's kind of where my mind went, is how is prophecy different? Because we have Jesus on the scene, everything is different and a little bit better understood. Uh, and yet, all those answers aren't even there to be had by Jesus, so we're not going to have all the answers either. So there's got to be, you know, there's some pulling of Old Testament prophecy into the New Testament all over the place. Some of it, like in Revelation, you know, you have several things in Ezekiel, and you've got some Daniel being pulled in, and, and various, there's some Zephaniah in Revelation. So it's sort of saying, look, this is yet to, this is, this, this is going to be fulfilled here in the future, or, you know, maybe, you know, this is a fuller understanding of that prophecy back then. So I think that my answer, which I I think is my answer is that it's all understood through the lens of Jesus. Prophecy has a main focus now. We know it. It's not just anticipated. It's, it's here. Jesus was here. He hung on the cross. He died. He came back. He ascended. We're waiting for him to come back. And so when we think about prophecy, it's got to be through the lens of Christ. I think that's... I just, I don't, I don't have that fleshed out in my mind enough, but it's pointing us, I think, in the right direction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but I think we're on to something, is what I want to say. Yes? I just put uh, New Testament prophecy is seen in the light of an eternal plan. And it just is worked out through Jesus. That's just, yeah, we're saying the same things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think that's what, I think that's what it is. I mean, it's, it's more focused in some ways, it's better understood because Jesus came, you know? There were people who were missing it. You know, you think of Nicodemus coming at night because he's, could this really be? I'm, I think he might be, and, and now we know. I mean, we know Jesus we also, is the one. We yeah. also talked about the fact that um, the Old Testament, the, it was so much the letter of the law. Yeah. Yeah, Galatians is great to read on that, right? Uh, as far as New Testament talking about those two differences and um, that Jesus brings a new law. It's not a new law. It's just fulfilled by Jesus' law that he now gives us that is available through him. And, and so, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just using too many words. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the idea that of, of love and forgiveness and compassion yeah. Though they had all the letters, everything lined up right, they yeah. still had no compassion or... But they, they did. You know, that's part of why I wanted to pull in uh, Habakkuk 2.4, because, you know, the righteous will live by faith. You know, that was there. And so, but it wasn't fully understood. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. The context is completely sentence. fulfilled in a way that we... Yeah, they couldn't know fully. That's why he was upset with the Pharisees, because... Yeah. Yeah. Lost the heart. 
Yep, yep. And I, I think that one of the things that it was um, a hard concept for me to walk through in, in uh, it was while I was an undergrad, was the professor said that, that the Old Testament temple and sacrifices didn't forgive sin. And I'm like, but wait a minute. It, the scripture says in the Old Testament, you know, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And that's why the sacrificial system, you know, and you had the shedding of blood way back when Adam and Eve fell, and he made, the Lord made skins for them. There was a sacrifice, right? And, um, and the forgiveness piece was already but not yet, even back then, right? There's this concept of already but not yet. And so it covered over sin until such a time as Christ finally forgave that sin on the cross. Old Testament sins were covered over until Christ, right? And then he, his, his cross forgives all sins, past, present, and future, for those who are his children. And so as you, as you walk through the Old Testament, there are some pieces to it that we, I just, it's hard to hang on to because it's slippery, because we're in the New Testament, we know about all the fulfillment stuff, and yet somebody who was in love with God, went to the temple, brought their doves, or brought their grain offering, or brought the, the young calf or, or bull or whatever, they were doing it out of a heart that beat for, for God and not necessarily the letter of the law, but there were some who did that because it was a letter of the law. And that was not forgiveness. That was a totally different thing. Well, and so, well, yeah. It was, yeah, yeah, yes and no. I mean, it was, it was a, yes, it was a physical manifestation of us understanding that our sins has to have a sacrifice, right? And, and so it was, it was only a part of the answer that was yet to come fully to, to know it in Christ. But isn't there a difference between sin and sins? And so the sins, like the lying, the cheating, whatever, yeah. those are your sins that maybe an animal's covering could deal with yeah. to a certain extent. But your original sin, the sin that we have because of Adam and Eve, yeah. that's really what, I mean, Christ, I think, carried it all. But that was what was really the death knell to Satan was when he dealt with that sin, that sin nature. Yeah. I, and now we have power over that sin nature that we didn't before. Re it's, yeah, it's for, yeah, and the, the fact that God can forget sin is a God thing that I wish we all could have because it would let us off a, a lot of agony. And eventually, I think that's one of the last things that our sin won't be able to have a, a hold of us like that. When, when Christ comes back and we're given our new bodies, I think that's a, a, a kind of a further removal of sin. Um, and and that I think why I'm talking about that is that, that there's this progressive nature of unfolding of how God is reconciling us to him fully when Christ returns. When this flesh stuff on the outside will look just like the way I am on the inside. And I think that Old Testament temple sacrifices was the plan until the next thing came, which was Christ. And then he's going to return, and it will be the full completion that was inaugurated. In the uh, Gospel of John 20, I think it's 17, Jesus has just appeared to the disciples in the room where they're hiding for fear. Yeah. They're going to be crucified next or whatever. Yep. Yeah. They're coming for us. And the first lesson he teaches the disciples is, Whatever you forgive is forgiven, and whatever you don't forgive is unforgiven. Yeah, I don't know how to do that one either. That's a tough passage, but there's, yeah. <laughs> well, you thought, you know, it's a I big deal. I was just resurrected. I'm back here telling yep. you yep. forgiveness. That's important. It's very important, yes. Absolutely. And true forgiveness, final Forgiveness was not found until the cross. 
I mean, everything that came before was covered over until the cross, and then everything after is also forgiven for those who confess, you know, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved, right? Romans 10, 9, and 10. So we're experiencing that now in a way that they could, just didn't have in the Old Testament, but those who loved the Lord in the Old Testament had as the wellspring of God working in, in their lives, but just in, a, in an Old Testament way, right? So, yeah, putting it all together, there's, there's a reason why men and women spend their whole lives studying this stuff. You know, and, and for us to think and get our brains, you smell that wood burning? It's, it's, it's going on in here right now. We're, we're working hard to think about these things. It's important to think about these things, to ground our faith in Scripture. So, so yeah, yes. I like Yep. Testified to the character of God. Everything he told him he would do, he did. And we know that God loved those people, but at the time that the temple was destroyed, they go off into slavery, they come back and they get dispersed again. All of this was a test testament to the character of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we look back and we know God did all those things, he was faithful to all of his work. Yep. His love and his character yep. steadfast yep. and yep. like the word right there. You just you just basically spoke lament right there. That's that's what lament, biblical lament is in a nutshell. There's this difficult things that I know, but I'm gonna stand on the truths that are deeper than the difficulties and the sufferings that I feel. And uh, God tells you the wrong things. Prophecy is is that God is telling his people that they are off track is a loving message, right? To not allow your children. Go play in the street. Like yeah, to, to, to not allow your children to get far away from you, to warn them, is to be loving. And is it, I just think it's interesting that the world tells us a different message. You know, let them find their own truth and this and that, and you know, the hands off and let them discover for themselves really i don't think that's a smart way to go it's not very loving and that i think that that was running in the back of my mind that that prophecy really every one of those is a love letter that god has written in the scriptures to his people and uh, he really doesn't single too many people out in scripture and our, our text says that you know it's a corporate understanding of prophecy it's nation he's referring to the nation and not an individual now there are some individuals that are singled out in the narrative passages Achan you know the battle of AI and all that so we have those but it's hey I'm speaking to you as a people and that's really the way God deals with his chosen people and uh, even Ro in Romans, Paul says that not all Israel is Israel, but yet he deals with them as a people. And, uh, and I think that's loving too. Because one of the worst things is to have your, a flag thrown on the field and then they call your number and tell, you, tell everyone why it was a problem. <laughs> you know, holding number 72, defense. You know, that's a little bit of that goes on in Scripture, but it's really hey, as a nation, you're in trouble. You need to shape up. 